Strommarktes. Denn We're going to have to reform the electricity market. Currently, gas dominates the price of the electricity market. Many of you know there's different sources of energy, but gas dominates and marks the price. The inflation rate now is, is high. It's either extremely high compared to the target. And that kind of cyclical distance even if you're fully confident over time inflation will return to 2%. There is uh, essentially a, an adjustment phase there, which is a lot of this inflation has been unexpected. Stocks can actually go up even as interest rates rise and as there is concern over inflation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, in for Francine this week. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Message received. U.S. markets fell yesterday for a second day. A little stronger today as Wall Street digests Jay Powell's warnings. The Fed's Neil Kashkari says it's a sign investors are listening. Intervention in tensions. The European Union considers decoupling gas and electricity prices ahead of an emergency meeting in Brussels. Meanwhile, the UK Chancellor tells Bloomberg he's working on additional measures to help households and businesses with sky-high energy bills. We know we need to do more because uh, by December, January, and then of course into next year, uh, those bills uh, will probably go up further. So I'm preparing options for the new incoming Prime Minister to be able to do even more. Well, markets attempting to claw back from the nearly one and a half trillion dollars that was wiped off in yesterday's sell off. Of course, all of that spurred from a Fed that is talking about tightening the need for persistence and the pain that might cause. We had Neil Kashkari yesterday speaking to Odd Lot saying that stocks, the markets, they've gotten the message. So what does it mean that we're seeing equities rebound today? They are being led by the riskier assets. For example, in Europe, technology is outperforming the benchmark. Bitcoin, for example, will back up above $20,000 at 1.5%. Not surprising, of course, to see a bounce after sharp losses yesterday. Of course, positioning, it was already pretty light. There's a lot of already downside exposure, so perhaps that's why we didn't see too much of something that looked like capitulation. Of course, there could still be more to come. The dollar, that is a little bit weaker, but the story has been that of dollar dominance over everything else. So quick look at your map of Europe this morning. Again, it is a story of buying some of the dip of consolidation in this market. Not a strong bias to the upside, but it is upside today. Even though the UK markets, those are up six tenths of a percent despite the fact that they were closed yesterday so they are underperforming making up for some of the losses but we are on the highs of the sessions up about one percent for most of these indexes here in Europe of course a lot of strife in Europe as we consider the energy crisis though let's stick with that U.S. story for a bit so we had those sharp losses yesterday and on Friday after Jay Powell's speech uh, where he indicated to investors of course that there might be more pain to come. And investors, they've gotten the message. That's according to Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari. Speaking on Bloomberg's Odd Lots podcast, Kashkari added, it shows how firm the Fed's commitment to getting inflation back down to 2%. Just how I certainly was not is. excited to see the stock market rallying uh, after our last uh, Federal Open Market Committee meeting because I know how committed we all are to getting inflation down. And I somehow think the markets were misunderstanding that. And I was actually happy to see how Chair Powell's Jackson Hole speech was received. You know, people now understand the seriousness of our co commitment to getting inflation back down to 2%. We're now joined by Geraldine Sundstrom, Portfolio Manager for Asset Allocation Strategies at PIMCO. Geraldine, great to have you on the program this morning. So there you have Neil Kashkari talking about the fact that they're pleased the markets have gotten the message. Is it too cute to say that the message from the Fed is that equities, that markets, they can't rally too much for them to reach their goals? It would be a treacherous thing to do, but certainly, you know, the pricing of equities is a combination of a number of things, and the re interest rates is one part. But, of course, there are other parts. There's what multiple people are willing to pay uh, for it and how earnings are going to behave. 
So when we look at earnings, we think a probability of a recession is relatively elevated when we look at the 12 to 24 months ahead. So that would be bad news for earnings. And in terms of multiple, when you have an alternative in the shape of higher yielding bonds, it's likely that the market is also willing to uh, price those earnings with a lower multiple. So altogether, uh, we would think that equities here are on the expensive side of things. But as I said, um, the, the, the interest rates of the Fed is just one element of the pricing of equities. Yeah, I mean, a great point, Geraldine. It's, it's a point that Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley makes as well, saying that the first half, it was all about interest rate risk, whereas the second half, it's earnings risk, where he says there's material downside. So earnings are a risk, Geraldine. But how big of a risk are they? Are you expecting, for example, something that looks akin to an earnings recession as we go through the rest of this year? That's what we would think of. Uh, that's what our models are showing. But, you know, you have to put a lot of caveat to this. So far, there's been some resilience. And the U.S. economy, I would say, is doing relatively well. Uh, most of our worries are more on the, this continent in Europe, where the situation, uh, the energy market shock, and what will happen to consumer is yet to be seen. Uh, most we, we know about all this bad news. We read about it in the newspaper. We see it on TV. But it has not really genuinely hit the consumer yet. And therefore, the contour of where inflation is headed in Europe, what's going to happen to growth, um, is pretty uncertain. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll get more into that European uncertainty in, in just a bit, Geraldine, because obviously that, that's a massive story. I do wonder what you're doing at the corporate bond market right now. Corporate bonds, much like that of equities, of course, risk assets have been hurt over the past week. I'm looking at spreads on triple C's versus B's. That's at a two-year high. So it's that credit risk coming back into the market where previously it had been all about interest rate risk. Would you want to own junk bonds right now, Geraldine? Are you concerned about credit risk as well? When we look at credit, it has sold off quite a bit more than equities. And in terms of relative valuation, it's probably more attractive than equities at this juncture. That said, we are more likely than not going to enter a recession. And it's typically not a very good moment uh, to go big into credit at that stage. So what we do is to go into more resilient, higher quality type of credit, like securitized paper, investment grade paper um, and stir away in general from the higher part, uh, from the riskier part of the credit market. Well, one, one certainly winning trade this year, Geraldine, has been energy. I mean, I was just looking back at what U.S. stocks have done. The energy index in the S&P is up 51 percent this year. And that, of course, compares to an index overall that's down 15 percent. So when you look at something that has such a big outperformance, energy, of course, the high prices, it continues to be a theme. But at what point do you actually want to take profit on those winners, um, despite perhaps some of the, the enduring thematics of high energy costs? Well, certainly when we look at the type of earnings growth that the oil companies have brought to the overall index, it's very high. And we feel that at this stage, it's unlikely that you get again the same type of increase. It could remain quite elevated for a bit because the transition of energy is a slow process as we figure. The war is still ongoing and we don't know when it will be finished. But um, at this juncture, there's probably more of a hold uh, than anything else. And we'll have to see also what is happening in Europe once again in terms of uh, windfall taxes on energy company, and that might uh, really impact the performance uh, mm. more on the European side than the U.S. side, of course, once again. Okay, Geraldine, stay right there. I want to get more into that conversation, so don't go anywhere. Geraldine Sundstrom, Portfolio Manager for Asset Allocation Strategies at PIMCO, stays with us. Speaking of which, coming up, the EU signals it wants to make big changes to its energy market. The soaring gas prices continue to bite. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. 
And the European Union is preparing to step into the energy market. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen says short-term intervention will dampen soaring power costs. For more on this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Birgit Yenin in Berlin. So Birgit von der Leyen, of course, talking about separating the prices of high gas from that of power prices. What measures are they actually considering here? Well, von der Leyen um, was fairly clear less yesterday that they are looking at the different two kind of way strategy. On the one hand, a long term strategy which looks at actually restructuring the European energy market, but actually they are also pointing at the volatile uh, market at the moment. And they, they and she then said sort of that they are needing really something in the short term, also to get basically the the, the prices. Uh, uh, a bit under control and and she was really clearly pointing at a certain measures where she said that um, it's fine for companies to do um, uh, profit, but really the profit should be limited. So um, there was this kind of hint of a, a profit uh, cap. Talk to me about the differences between regions, Birgit, because in France of, France, of course, we have this exacerbation from some of the nuclear outages. How are governments tackling this, tackling the nuances of each energy market? Well, this is exactly one of the problems. Um, I mean, France basically currently has a problem with their nuclear plants, and that puts under the EU regulation, Germany under the spot of actually providing in this tight situation where Germany is also facing massive energy shortage from Russia, in the obligation to deliver gas um, and now to, to France. So there is a bit of uh, force and back going on currently between uh, Germany and France. But really, uh, the, the European Union is here in the short in order to find a solution and basically a new formula of how to uh, kind of shift the energy from Germany and, and from France and actually within Europe so that there is a sort of balance reached. Okay, Birgit, thank you very much. That's Bloomberg's Birgit Yen in there in Berlin. Still with us is Geraldine Sundstrom, Portfolio Manager for Asset Allocation Strategies at PIMCO. I mean, Geraldine, I, I, I sort of have been racking my brain trying to figure out exactly how this would work and, and whether it would be successful to try to separate the price of high nat gas versus that of power. When you, when you look at some of these proposals, laid out by governments, does it give you any comfort that perhaps the winter in Europe can avoid some of the worst of what's expected? Well, certainly the markets seem to be reacting, but at the moment it's really big uncertainty when it comes to that question about we, we have problems, of course, with gas. Uh, your colleague mentioned nuclear, but hydropower as well. The drought is also a big problem. So there is shortage of power, whichever way uh, you look at, how they're going to pull the mechanism, transfer, and then, of course, you also still need to encourage investment in renewable energy in the future. So how to weigh all of this uh, might be a little bit of a, of a big puzzle, and certain countries might have different incentives. So it remains to be seen, but certainly when you have electricity power uh, in Germany trading at $1,600 per barrel uh, in oil equivalent, um, emergency is there and countries need to react. And, and, you know, we had Goldman's head of, of energy research on, uh, on Bloomberg yesterday essentially saying that one of the proposals putting price caps on, and I know that's something you've spoken about as well, Ger Geraldine, of having this perverse effect of actually increasing demand when, of course, right now what we want is demand to be lower to match where supply is. When you look at proposals like that, what does that bring to mind for you in terms of where inflation goes from here? What happens to the energy crisis if households don't feel the actual effects of where real prices are? Yes, it's going to be like a bit of a trade-off situation. On the one hand, um, if you put a cap, growth is going to do better um, and inflation should also behave better. On the other hand, this probably means more fiscal deficits when it comes to country, more subsidies, higher demand, and on the other side, it's more debt issuance and potentially a bigger trade deficit. So this will have implications in terms of interest rates, in terms of shape of curve, foreign exchange, um, quite quite a, a big things that we are like um, 
trying to brainstorm. But what it seems mm. when we look at all of this is that the trade balance is the thing that is for sure going to be hurt when, um, because there's nothing. Europe has to import uh, this energy and there's very little they can do about it. Yeah, and then if there's demand destruction, it also means less exports. I mean, that just makes me think of what's going to happen to the euro then, Geraldine. We've already seen it sink below parity. It's above that level today. But do you expect there to be more pain for the euro, given what you're just laying out there? Well, the, the trade balance is in dire shape. Um, we don't know for how long uh, this war will be, for how long those type of energy prices are going to stay. But the cost uh, of importing uh, this uh, energy in terms of LNG or other things is absolutely huge. And Europe used to have uh, quite a bit of a surplus. You add on top of this the fact that the world is slowing as well. Um, and that other central banks around the world are increasing rates equally fast or even faster than the ECB, it means that the prospect for the euro uh, will be challenged. All the more than this energy dependence really will bring a big question mark for many companies in terms of long-term investments on the continent. So, okay, extrapolate then that into what your portfolio in Europe is looking like right now, Geraldine. Are you just avoiding the continent as a whole for assets there, or where are pockets of strength that you see arising? Generally speaking, yes, the an underweight stance depends on your mandate and portfolio to Europe uh, when it comes to uh, fixed income equities or even currency for that matter. Um, it has corrected a lot. Assets have underperformed in general, but the risks ahead remain quite large and uncertainty is such that uh, this extra risk premium is more than warranted. If anything, we would think that um, certain markets might not have reacted as much as the potential uh, downfall. If we're talking about this gloomy outlook for Europe, Geraldine, I mean, does it, does it make sense that some at the ECB are debating 75 basis points for their next meeting? Well, being at the ECB is a tough job at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And we are seeing increasingly strikes uh, in Europe, wage demands going higher, understandably. And they're probably going to have to fight a price-wage uh, spiral, uh, potentially, in Europe. So um, the ECB is going to have to find to thread, uh, you know, something very, very delicate in terms of hardship on household, uh, wage demands, strikes, lower output, and interest rates. Um, in that sense, the Fed has a much easier job on their hands. Yeah, certainly I don't envy any of them, Geraldine. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Great to catch up with you. Geraldine Sundstrom, their Portfolio Manager for Asset Allocation Strategies at PIMCO. Coming up, UK Chancellor Nadim Sahawi says the next Prime Minister will have a plan to ease the cost of living crisis. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Let's get to the Bloomberg First Word News. With that is Leanne Garens. Leanne. Good morning, Danny. The Fed's Neil Kashkari says he's happy to see investors have finally got the message about how serious the central bank is fighting inflation. Jerome Powell's hawkish speech at Jackson Hole sparked a sharp sell-off in stocks. Up till then, Kashkari says the markets were too eager to price in a policy pivot from the Fed. I certainly was not excited to see the stock market rallying uh, after our last uh, Federal Open Market Committee meeting because I know how committed we all are to getting inflation down and I somehow think the markets were misunderstanding that and I was actually happy to see how Chair Powell's Jackson Hole speech was received. You know, people now understand the seriousness of our co commitment to getting inflation back down to 2%. 
Now, the ECB's chief economist, Philip Lane, is urging a steady pace of rate hikes to fight record inflation. He thinks this will help minimize any negative consequences. The comments seem to push back against some of his colleagues who have floated the idea of a 75 basis point hike, which will come at next week's meeting. The U.S. is urging for a controlled shutdown of the Russian Sea's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine. It says that would be the fastest option due to continued shelling around Europe's largest such a facility. The International Atomic Energy Agency is conducting an inspection of the plant. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky is warning the situation does remain dangerous. Pakistan has secured a bailout from the International Monetary Fund to avert an imminent default. That's as political turmoil and deadly flooding do threaten the country. It can now withdraw the equivalent of around 1.2 billion US dollars from the IMF. The funds will be key in stabilizing Pakistan's economy facing Asia's second highest inflation rate. And finally, move over green tea. A new report is singing the benefits of bog standard black tea. It says Britons who drink several cups of English breakfast tea or Earl Grey each day tend to see lower risks of death compared to those who actually hardly drink it. The study tracked nearly half a million people over 14 years. Higher tea uptake was associated with lower risks of cardiovascular disease and also strokes. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrins. This is Bloomberg. For us coffee drinkers, Danny Berger, not sure how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it might be good for your health, but uh, coffee's good for my mental health, so I'll stick with that. Leanne, thanks so much, Leanne Garen's there. All right, coming up, Britain property asking prices fall the most in more than two years. We have more on the housing crisis next. This is Bloomberg. Stocks and equity futures are slightly higher as the post-Powell speech slide subsides. Intervention intentions. The European Union considers decoupling gas and electricity prices ahead of an emergency meeting in Brussels. Meanwhile, the UK Chancellor tells Bloomberg he is working on additional measures to help households and businesses with sky-high energy bills. We know we need to do more because uh, by December, January, and then of course into next year, uh, those bills uh, will probably go up further. So I'm preparing options for the new incoming Prime Minister to be able to do even more. Good morning. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, a quick check on your markets. You are looking at futures bouncing slightly higher this morning. Of course, that's after more than a trillion dollars worth of equity selling off yesterday. So it is risk on on your GMM screen this morning. But again, it really is just consolidation after yesterday's sell off. You're looking at some of the riskier currencies, for example, commodity currencies, those bouncing back. Aussie dollar is back, but dollar is weaker this morning but that's been the persistent trend bonds you are seeing yields move lower so a little bit of buying there perhaps save for the UK but of course it has some ground to make up for after yesterday's bank holiday as well UK Nat gas that's also why that one is sliding because Nat gas Dutch front month future slid yesterday but overall it is a story of an unfolding gas crisis so you know, a little bit of give back in today's market. But again, there's a question to how much we can actually read into it, given that those persistent bearish trends are still with us. All right, well, let's get more on the UK. And the chancellor of the country, Chancellor Nadim Zahawi, he's in the US. His plan is to meet with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen to discuss joint solutions to the cost of living crisis. He told Bloomberg that regardless of who replaces Boris Johnson as prime minister, new measures are coming to curb soaring energy bills. Putin has worked out that he can use energy, especially gas, as a way of getting back at us, at the British people, Germany and the rest of Europe, uh, through the use of um, you know, gas supply. And, and um, that is a, you know, something he's, he's weaponized. Uh, and we have to remain resilient. Uh, the Ukrainian people are um, facing a, you know, a really tough Mm. Uh, time, uh, a, 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 an illegal invasion of their country. Mm. Um, 
so we have to make sure that back home in the UK, uh, people have the help that they need. So at the moment, we have 37 billion pounds that we've put uh, to work to help people. Uh, yeah. Everybody will get 400 pounds off their energy bill um, uh, from October through yeah. to December. So that effectively halves the increase that has come through through the energy price cap. Mm. But we know we need to do more because uh, by December, January, and then of course into next year, uh, those bills uh, will probably go up further. We are now looking at what was sub £2,000 in general average for energy bills going up to above three and a Three, three and a half thousand. Yeah. That's right. So £400, as you say, helps knock off that half amount of the yeah. increase. But this is still a consumer that is feeling incredibly painful. So the lot to come mm -hmm. for those households that really need that have got no cushion at all. But I also, the moment I walked in, instructed my leadership team to say, look, we know Putin's going to continue to use this. We have to be able to withstand that pressure and send a message back to Mr Putin that this is not going to work. Therefore, we have to look at every option, mm. at what more we need to do come December and January and then obviously into next year. And, and we're working up all the options. So nothing is off the table, mm. but I want to be ready. So on the 5th of September, when the new prime minister walks into number 10, they can hit the ground running. Let's stay with the UK, but focus in on housing market dynamics, which are quickly changing. Market watchers are questioning whether a slowdown in new buyer inquiries combined with record high house prices, skyrocketing mortgage rates and an inflationary squeeze on disposable income, whether all those things are harbinger of a slowdown in house price growth. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. So, Lizzie, I know we, you just, you're looking at some data that just came in when it comes to mortgages, but where do we stand on this housing market? How worried should we be? Are there signs of a looming crash? Well, so the mortgage approvals data for July actually came in higher than expected, 63.8 thousand instead of 62 thousand, and it's actually up from the previous month. But what I would point out is that in June, we had a slowdown to the lowest level in two years. So this isn't the sort of place that you want to be at. The backdrop is you've got double digit inflation, that's swallowing wage growth. The BOE is having to respond with big rate hikes, uh, even though they've got the recession risks. So there are these warnings of a slowdown, potentially a crash. But uh, the chief economist at the Bank of England says, don't uh, worry too much about a crash because uh, you've got banks that are well capitalized, as you heard from Zahawi there. Uh, most people are on f uh, fixed rate mortgages, although they're going to get a rude awakening when uh, the t their terms expire and it's no longer rock bottom rates. Uh, and you would hope that banks would show forbearance as they did during the pandemic. Uh, but you are already seeing values falling in almost half of London boroughs. So mm. it is a worrying situation. Well, so we, you know, as you mentioned, we're just hearing from Zahawi talking about, you know, help when it comes to energy bills. What about housing? What will the next PM have to tackle when it comes to this? Well, you've seen government after government fail to build enough homes so that's uh, adding to a shortage which is pushing up prices but also there have been active policy interventions that have lifted prices the help to buy scheme the pandemic stamp duty holiday both of those are over now but whoever is the next prime minister be it Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak they're going to have to pump billions of pounds at helping people through the recession which in itself is going to mean there's less tax revenue mm. so what have they said so far well uh, Sunak said he won't build on the green belt to protect the UK countryside. Truss has said she'll drop the uh, target of building 300,000 homes a year. So this sh shortage of supply could continue, helping to a degree to boost prices. Bad news for first-time buyers, bad news for renters, because there'll mm. be more competition, pushing up rents and adding to the cost of living crisis. Yeah, and I mean, we, we do see the BOE talking about the effective interest rates on new mortgages rising to 2.3%. Also saying that UK credit card borrowing has risen the most since 2005. Lizzie, I wonder, okay, so on one hand, you have the BOE obviously trying to curb inflation by raising interest rates. On the other hand, you're talking about policies from the government trying to help folks deal with this cost of living crisis. Is, is there a degree to which they're kind of at odds? 
Yeah, and uh, I mean, there's the Twitterati <laughs> would, <laughs> ask, <laughs> would ask whether there's some sort of Tory conspiracy to keep on boosting <laughs> house prices. I've spoken to senior Conservatives who say that's not the case because it's only really in the interests of people who have recently bought a home because they're the ones who would be mainly worried about negative equity. So I'm assured it isn't a Tory conspiracy. <laughs> uh, but of course, it is a political, uh, a top political issue to help people get on the property ladder as a first time buyer. It was a top priority of Boris Johnson's. It'd be interesting to see once we're past this stage where the two candidates are appealing to the grassroots voters, uh, how much housing remains or mm. stops being a priority. Lizzie, interesting stuff as always. Thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden there breaking down the UK economic story for us. Coming up, we talk wider EU signaling it wants to make big changes to its energy market, but soaring gas prices continue to bite. We head to the MedDev conference in Paris. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. In France, Prime Minister Elizabeth Borne urged businesses to cut energy use or face possible rationing this winter if Russia halts gas deliveries. We only have one way to go to cut our energy consumption. I suggest that we organize this reduction together. If we do not do this, if everyone does not do their part, some sudden gas cuts could take place overnight, with serious economic and social consequences. Let's head over, for Fran head over to France, where the biggest business lobbies having their annual summer conference. Bloomberg's Caroline Conan is there with a guest. Caroline. And I'm very happy to be joined by Dominique Carlac. She's uh, the vice president of the MEDEF and also the CEO of her own company, uh, DNC uh, Consultants. Uh, Dominique Carlac, uh, thank you for joining us from uh, the MEDEF. So, thank you. Of course, there is a lot of talk uh, this year about energy, right. about the impact of energy bills on uh, businesses, small, medium, bigger businesses. And we had the prime minister, Elizabeth Bond, yesterday right here calling for businesses in France to cut voluntarily their energy consumption by probably at least 10% this winter. How do you think French businesses can achieve this? So, first of all, it's not a question of talks only. It's a reality in our enterprises. Uh, small, medium and large companies uh, suffer from this crisis. So it is in, in her its interest to cut energy bill, of course. So we don't need government to say it and to understand this. It's a reality every day in our companies. So we have started some measures and now we are continuing. But. Uh, you have to think uh, on two levels. In the winter, of course, it's, it's, if it's too cold, we will try to modulate uh, the temperature. There's a low dating from 74, and we will adapt this law, and we will respect this law. There's already a law to, regal, to, to rule the temperature, so we will be very uh, volunteer because, because it's in our interest. The second step uh, will be on the long term. We absolutely need to change our mix to achieve this uh, transition, this energy trans transition. So we invest, we invest a lot. So, of course, it's nice to listen to the Prime Minister, it's important to us, but we share the same objective, absolutely the share objective, because it is in our interest and in the interest of our country and uh, of con on the continent also. The Prime Minister also warned about possible rationing. Uh, if these voluntarily uh, cuts are actually not achieved. So we also had NG this morning uh, saying that supplies uh, from Gazprom are going to be reduced again. Are you concerned about the impact of rationing if there is a total gas 
shut off from Russia? Of course, it will be a, a disaster. It will be a disaster because after the COVID crisis and then the Ukraine crisis, if we have to cut our production, it would be a disaster because uh, I think some enterprise can resist. But uh, what about the government? There was such a huge budget uh, invest in the first crisis, what about the government? My fear is not so much on the enterprise, in fact, but on the total global macroeconomic system. We're going to talk about the government uh, in a moment, but I, I, I want to ask you one more question on this uh, possible uh, rationing. Of course, you are talking about this law, which is basically uh, saying that uh, you cannot turn on the heating uh, if it's uh, less, if it's uh, at 19 degrees, and then you cannot turn on the air conditioning uh, unless it's more than 26 degrees uh, Celsius temperatures. Uh, of course, some companies can do this easily. Some some other companies, uh, I'm thinking about car production, other uh, production lines, they cannot really do this. We, we spoke yesterday to some businesses here who are concerned about the impact on production. Are we going to see more PMI contraction, more uh, uh, impact on GDP because of this? Yes, sure, sure. We have in construction, for example, uh, already some effects uh, because, uh, for example, on uh, the, the, the cars, the drive, the, the truck, we have to stop some trucks today because of this, because of this crisis. So, of course, there's an impact. Uh, but we trust in our enterprise. Of course, it's a very objective crisis, energy crisis. You have or you are, don't have energy. But uh, I think we will organize the production and the consumption, I think, because at the end, the consumption changes also. We change our habits, in fact. Price caps, you were talking about the price caps that have yeah. been put in place in France for households and for uh, very small companies. Uh, these price caps have uh, uh, already cost the government uh, 25 billion euros, yes. and it's expected to cost at least another 20 uh, billion euros over the next few months. How worried are you about the impact on public finances? Uh, it will increase the debt uh, one more time. So I, I'm not sure it's a good idea uh, to have general rule for the general continent. In fact, the situation is different in each country because we have different uh, industry system, we have different uh, uh, mixed energetic system. So I'm not sure that it's, it's, I think it's typical the good, bad idea, in fact. Do you think we should have a price cap at the EU level. That is something that could be discussed next week. Uh, there is a meeting with the EU energy ministers. Do you think we should have a price cap for everyone in Europe? At now, what we can observe, there are distortion, distortion between countries. For example, Spain and Portugal have caps and very slow ones. And for us, for our enterprise, it's very difficult to be competitive because of these very small caps. So it's positive to have a discussion on the Euro European uh, level. It's better. Finally, uh, very quickly, on a scale of uh, 1 to 10, how big is the recession risk uh, in France? 1 to 10? Wow, it's a difficult question. Uh, I'm French and not far from Normandy, so I would, be, I would say... Mm, four, not okay. five. Four. four, because we are in fact in stagflation. Small growth and high inflation. This is very difficult to absorb. Very diff difficult to absorb a stagflation. That was uh, Dominique Carlac, the uh, vice president of the MEDEF, of course, live uh, from this annual gathering of France's biggest business lobby when, where the uh, energy question is in everybody's mind. Caroline, thank you so much. Caroline Conan there from in Paris. Again, a very timely conversation as we look at the French power market continuing to hit new records. Where we are looking at a bit of relief today when it comes to nat gas prices and equities. But still, is it just a breather in what's been a very difficult summer heading into an even more difficult winter? More to come. This is Bloomberg.
the inflation rate now is, is high. It's you know, extremely high compared to the target. And that kind of cyclical distance, even if you're fully confident over time inflation will return to 2%, there is uh, essentially a, an adjustment phase there, which is a lot of this inflation has been unexpected. In the long run steady state, um, of course, we think about uh, or star, you add 2% inflation and you get the steady state nominal interest rate. But of course, uh, if we think about the next couple of years, we're not necessarily going to be in that long run steady state. Uh, we may have cyclical forces in either direction, cyclical forces that say that the uh, policy rate should be above the neutral rate. We may have cyclical forces that may say uh, the policy rate should be below the, that rate. ECB Chief Economist Philip Lane there speaking in Barcelona. He's also just moments ago speaking with local Spanish media, reiterating some of what he said there that the ECB needs to keep raising interest rates, that they need to do it step by step, that there's a risk of doing things too quickly. It also makes it easier to course correct is what he said yesterday if there are smaller hikes. Also saying that the euro area economy may shrink for some weeks and that data is pointing to a slowdown and weakened demand in the second half. Let's get to some of our other top stories this morning with your Bloomberg Business Flash is Leanne Garens. Good morning, Leanne. Good morning, Danny. French utility NG has said Russia's Gazprom has informed it of a reduction in gas delivery starting from today that is due to disagreements over some contracts. It signals a further squeeze on Europe's energy supplies. It follows a call from French Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne for businesses to cut their energy use or face possible rationing this winter. German energy giant Uniper is looking to extend its governing credit line to 13 billion euros. It's the latest sign of how Europe's energy crisis is getting even worse. The utility has requested an additional 4 billion euros from Germany's state-owned lender. The cost for Uniper of replacing missing supplies from Russia is leading to losses of more than 100 million euros a day. Lawyers for both Elon Musk and Twitter are subpoenaing the social media firm's recent whistleblower. He said the platform's officials did not know or care how many of its accounts were spam or bots. Both sides are collecting testimony ahead of a trial on in October. Elon Musk is looking to cancel his $44 billion payout of the company. And Microsoft is changing the terms of its software licensing agreements. It follows complaints from some European cloud computing providers providers at the company's practices put rivals at a competitive disadvantage. The changes take effect from October the 1st and explicitly do not apply to Amazon, Google or Alibaba. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Danny. Leanne, thank you so much. All right, let's get a quick look at some of the things we're watching out for today. In just a few minutes, five minutes time, we're going to have Euro Area Confidence Surveys. Then at 1 p.m., it's going to be Germany CPI readings. 3 p.m., U.S. Conference Board Consumer Confidence Survey. And later, we're also going to get some more ECB talk from Governing Council member Robert Holtzman, among other guests at the Outback Forum. Also later today, it's the New York Fed President John Williams speaking at an event hosted by the Wall Street Journal. Well, as we close out the hour, it's a day of weaker commodity prices. Oil is falling, metals are falling. Perhaps that's allowing some relief in the equity market, which is moving higher after yesterday's sell-off, but how long can it last? More market conversations to come with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This is Bloomberg. Fed will likely keep hiking until they really see progress being made here. We think it's good that the Fed is doing what it's doing. It's on the case. They want to make sure that they can strangle inflation. High risk came back in the market very quickly. People are starting to realize QT is coming. This balance sheet reduction is here. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong are top stories today. The markets get the message. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says the recent stock sell-off shows investors understand the Fed is serious about fighting inflation. Meanwhile, global bonds have been sliding toward the first bear market in a generation. The EU's set to intervene in energy markets. The bloc plans to limit price hikes as the continent braces for shortages this winter. 
And the U.S. will sell $1.1 billion of missiles and radar to Taiwan, the biggest sale in almost two years. It's certain to fan tensions with China. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta are with me in New York. Kaylee Lyons is off today. And Kriti, stabilization seems to be the word that people are using to describe what we're seeing in risk assets today. A little bit of a bounce back, and it certainly is all starting with the Asia session. This idea here that after really the carnage that we saw yesterday, you are starting to see a lot of the Asia Pacific index. Think China, think Japan, even think Korean stocks. Well, they are bouncing back. Take a look at this. It is up about 1% across the region. Not quite making up, like I said, for the selling pressure that we saw yesterday, but it is a start. Anna. And let's actually also take a look at what's going on specifically with Japanese stocks. The Nikkei making a really big rebound, up 1%. A lot of that driven by tech stocks in particular. So that's going to be crucial to see whether or not that kind of sentiment and that kind of leadership really translates to the U.S. session of via Europe, of course. But the currency story to me remains the key story, this idea of strength in Asian currencies as they really try to deal with uh, the fallout of a very hawkish Federal Reserve. What does that mean when the consensus trade is the higher, stronger dollar? Specifically looking at the Chinese yuan here, once again, the fixing for a fifth straight day coming out stronger than expected the, compared to the average estimate, of course, surveyed by Bloomberg, uh, the Bloomberg terminal. This is going to be crucial when it comes to simply at what point do Chinese exports, the idea that uh, exports are going to be more attractive with a weaker currency, actively come into to conflict with this new strengthening regime. And of course, as you see that strength in China, you do start to see strength in Japan as well. The Japanese yen a little bit stronger on the day. Matt? The currency story is the key story for you, huh, Kriti? It always is. It always is. All right, I'm looking at a little bit of bounce back here as well. You can see futures are up eight tenths of 1% right now. And we see a turnaround in a lot of these other risk metrics. For example, the 10 year yield yesterday at this time was at 311. Well, okay, uh, London trading was closed yesterday, and now they're back from a bank bank holiday, but it had closed at 311 in Asia. And now we're back down to 305.58. So moving down there as investors buy bonds and the dollar is weakening as well. Yesterday we were getting close to 1300. We were at 1299 at this time. Right now we're at 1289. So coming off the currency story important to me as well. Bitcoin currency or commodity, it could be argued, um, but it is up 1% and change right now. So of course it's very positively correlated with other risk assets. As you would imagine, it's gaining strength and finally back above that $20,000 level after going down to 18 over the weekend. Anna, what do you see in Europe? Uh, we see a, a strength to Europe, a, a rebound, stabilization, call it what you like, but we are seeing a little bit of recovery from the selling of yesterday. London is playing catch up here. Matt was mentioning that London was closed yesterday. Of course, UK markets generally were closed, and so we play catch up. So a little more muted gains coming through in London. We saw losses across Europe yesterday. We bounced back from some of those. The CAC up a percent, the DAX up by 1.4%. Bear in mind where we've got to on the Eurozone confidence story, though, the August economic confidence uh, number just hitting the Bloomberg terminal, falling to 97 7.6. The estimate was 98. Confidence very fragile, of course, in an economy that is looking ahead to a winter that could get tough in terms of energy. Let's bring the catch-up story of London and also the energy things together and show you what's going on with energy prices here on the UK benchmark. This is just one day's move down by 27%. Incredible volatility we're seeing in gas prices here. But this again is playing catch-up with yesterday's move uh, that we saw in continental European gas prices where we saw a substantial drop. Not that big, but certainly very substantial as a result of those head lines around Germany filling up its storage more quickly than had been anticipated. That's followed by a sequel today that suggests that across Europe we're filling up that storage much more quickly. Interesting to see the natural gas feature that, uh, sorry, price in the benchmark across Europe is dropping again for another day, down by 4.8%. Some of those more pan-European headlines around storage helping and shaking off earlier, uh, earlier moves higher that we saw in that price as a result of those Angie headlines saying that Gazprom was going to send reduced flows to the French utility. This is Brent crude. I put it in because I think it's important to keep an eye on the fact that we're, uh, we sort of stealthily crept our way back up to uh, above $100 and we're at 104. So highest levels we've seen since around the end of July. So even though we're seeing a drop of eight tenths of a percent today, uh, no impact coming through from the violence in Iraq, we're told. There is concern about what happens to production in Libya. So all of those in the mix there. Uh, interesting to look at what's going on in bond markets today. The big picture story, and Matt was talking about this earlier on with the, uh, with the team. The big picture story is about uh, bond markets having sold off, of course, and yields going higher but today looks a little bit different and what's being credited for that in Europe is some of the inflation data regional in nature coming out of Germany has been at the margin not as red hot as it could have been Chrissy. 
a lot to digest, especially when it comes to that inflation data, which brings me to what we're looking at ahead today. Later this morning, we'll get that German inflation data. ECB governing council members are also due to speak about inflation at an event in Austria. And we'll also hear from Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin and New York Fed President John Williams today. We get U.S. consumer confidence and jolts job openings at 10 a.m. Wall Street time. And President Biden will make his first of three trips to Pennsylvania this week. He'll deliver remarks on his Safer America plan in Wilkes bar later today, Matt. All right, we'll be watching all of those things, especially the inflation numbers. Let's get right now, though, back to the U.S. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari sees the recent sell-off as evidence the market is finally taking the central bank's inflation fight seriously. He spoke in an interview with Bloomberg's Odd Lots podcast. And I was actually happy to see how Chair Powell's Jackson Hole speech was received. You know, people now understand the seriousness of our co commitment to getting inflation back down to 2%. Bloomberg's Michelle Jamrisco joins us now. So Michelle Kashkari has been talking a lot lately. He is um, the most hawkish dove, I guess, uh, that there is. What, what else did you find useful in his latest remarks? Yeah, we can't get enough Kashkari these days, Matt. I mean, of course, on its face, this seems like just more Fed cheerleading about their team captain uh, delivering this strong message out of Jackson Hole that finally, as you say, is getting through to markets. Uh, but, you know, a few things interesting out of this interview. I think one thing first is that he talked about, you know, that hawkish pace. He talked about this concern about monetary policy lags that we've been talking about, you know, that came up in the minutes. He addressed that by saying that the way to deal with these lags is to get somewhere and to sit there until we're really convinced that we've got inflation licked and that's quoting him directly so he's his way of dealing with this of course is a very hawkish view let's let's get to that inflation fight let's push 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 and then wait for a bit and see how it lands now again drawing on the 1970s he, he went back to the Volcker era just like Powell did in his speech but he did it in a different way in terms of highlighting not just you know Paul Volcker this inflation fighter you know the hero here but also the mistake that those policymakers made in, the, in that episode where they thought they were done, they weren't done, they backed off, and then things got worse. So what he was saying is, let's mind that warning again, the 1970s, we don't want to make the same mistake. And finally, he conveyed a bit of humility and uncertainty about the situation. He talked about the drivers in inflation being unusual. Of course, he says, normally we would expect that a tight labor market might create wage growth, then business costs and are passed on, and then it creates broader inflation. We're not dealing with that story right now. We're dealing with a much more uncertain, complex story with, of course, those supply chain effects the war in Ukraine and, uh, you know, fiscal and monetary stimulus that's impacting the inflation picture right now. Well, Michelle, something I think fewer people are talking about this week is a new phase of the Fed's quantitative tightening program. The run rate set to double to about $95 million per month. Where do we see the impact there? Yeah, Kriti, uh, you know, I think it's been a while since we all were following Far Bast Go, that terminal function that has the Fed's balance sheet. But it will be more in focus this week, of course. Uh, this week marks a ramp up in the unwinding of that $9 trillion balance sheet. So I want to get these monthly caps right, but we're moving into holdings of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities that are maturing will now be set at $60 billion and $35 billion. It also means that the Fed is unloading a lot of treasury bills that amassed three years ago in very different crisis times. So one key impact to look for, and and I'll borrow this from my colleague, Alexander Harris, who outlined this in a story today. Those money market investors that were parking excess cash in the reverse repurchase agreement facility should come back to the market now as the Fed hikes slow and as the Treasury issues more T-bills. So that's one impact that we're looking at. I think more broadly and internationally, including here in Asia, is that all of this will probably create more pressure, upward pressure on the dollar, of course, then mm. Im impacting currencies, local currencies, and depreciation, depreciation and creating more headaches. So so the Fed has to hope for a smoother journey than the last time we went, underwent QT a few years ago. Uh, they do think that they have better reserves and a better process this time, so we'll see how that shakes out. Okay. Michelle, thanks so much. Bloomberg's Michelle Jamrisco joining us with the latest on Fed Watch. Uh, we're on Gas Watch here in Europe, of course. The European Union is planning to step into the energy market to dampen soaring power costs and eventually break the link between gas and electricity prices. Commission uh, President Ursula von der Leyen spoke yesterday in Berlin. We're going to have to reform the electricity market. Currently, gas dominates the price of the electricity market. Many of you know there's different sources of energy, but gas dominates and marks the price. That's been the case for a long time. But with these exorbitantly high gas prices, we're going to have to decouple. 
Joining us now here in London, Will Kennedy, Bloomberg Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities. Will, thanks very much for joining us. So what's going to be the prior, uh, priority here? Is it about capping prices overall or is it about breaking a link between gas and electricity prices? What should the focus be? Well, I think they're going to talk about doing both of those things. Uh, neither is simple and neither is a magic bullet. Uh, if there's a move to cap prices, obviously that could be very helpful, but someone is going to have to pay. You can't change the international market price for gas. You can't change the dire shortage of gas supplies into Europe. So it would probably be a way to share the burden of some way between government, uh, consumers and mm. utilities, uh, but details are very slight. On the breaking of the link that van der Leyen was talking about there, that's probably something more for the long term. Right now, power prices are set by the marginal uh, price of the most expensive source of energy, which tends to be gas right now. A lot of people are pointing out that nuclear uh, and renewables have much lower costs, so why don't we try and move towards a different system? But it's, again, not Wait, easy to construct w that system. Will, I, yeah, sorry. I, sorry, I, sorry to interrupt, but I, I keep hearing about this the last couple of days. Is that set in regulatory... Uh, legislation. I mean, even if you want to sell solar, wind, or nuclear power for less, you have to charge the highest price of whatever energy asset is is priced um, higher. What I was going, yes, exactly right. What I was going to say is that the market is set up that way because that's how you send the right price signals to get uh, balance the market and get the supplies that you need. The, the, the marginal uh, megawatt is going to be the most expensive megawatt. Now, are there other ways to design the market that? averages out the, the different costs of su uh, supply, possibly, but ah, it's complicated okay. and not easy to do. Thanks very much, Will. Will Kennedy with the latest on energy markets. Uh, really interesting. So there's something in it about the long-term uh, uh, redesign and the short-term capping. We'll monitor both. Uh, we'll discuss more on Europe's energy crisis later this hour in an exclusive interview with the French industry minister. Now over to Washington. And the US is concerned about the energy shortage in Europe too and will work to alleviate that potential threat as the European Union faces soaring power prices ahead of winter. This is all according to a top White House aide. Meanwhile, in Washington, on the domestic front, President Biden is set to deliver a primetime speech on Thursday, slamming Republicans for what he sees as their threats to U.S. rights and freedoms. He's trying to boost Democrats' chances in the November elections. Emily Wilkins, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now from D.C. What should we expect then? So this in this primetime speech on Thursday in Philadelphia, we're going to be expecting Biden to really criticize Republicans and paint them again as a threat to democracy. He is brushing off the playbook that he used when he won uh, the presidency in 2020, saying that Republicans pose a severe threat to the country uh, just in terms of a Democratic standpoint. He's going to point to the fact uh, that Republicans have now encouraged abortion bans now with the overturning of Roe versus Wade. He's going to point to election laws that they passed that have made it slightly more difficult for individuals to vote. And he's going to point to the fact that there are still Republicans out there pushing the false claim that the 2020 election was stolen. And this isn't just a message you're hearing from Biden. Really, across the Democratic Party, you're hearing more and more uh, lawmakers who are hitting the campaign trail talking about the MAGA Republicans. Of course, that's a reference to, to former President Trump and the slogan that he used, the Make America Great Again. And really, it's this narrative that Democrats are trying to push, that Republicans are just too extreme. This is coming at a time where Democrats are seen a little more hopeful for November and their ability to keep the House and the Senate. But this is going to be an incredibly tough midterm for them. It always is for mm. the party that's in power. And uh, Joe Biden's fairly low approval ratings, even though they've gone up a little bit, aren't super helping with that. Well, he's certainly um, trying to be as much of a China hawk, I guess, as he can. The Biden administration prepping a $1.1 billion arms sale to Taiwan. It's not a huge number, but it's the most in two years. How serious is this? It's definitely serious, especially considering that it's coming on the heels of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's historic visit to Taiwan. And she's not the only one who's gone. You've seen bipartisanship in support for Taiwan from American lawmakers. You saw Democratic Senator Ed Markey go. You saw Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn visit the island, meet with officials there. This is just continuing in that vein of the Congress trying to show support for Taiwan, even at the risk of the fact that Beijing has suggested that they could potentially retaliate again for this. Uh, you've already seen some retaliation. You've seen them sending warships and, and missiles uh, through the Taiwan Strait in the Taiwan area. Uh, but at the same point, you're seeing that Congress has really doubled down in a bipartisan way um, in their support of the island.
Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government, we thank you as always covering a broad array of topics for us. Let's look at some of the stocks moving now in pre-market trading in the United States. Bed Bath & Beyond, top of our list as we really keep an eye on that retail bid. Now it's on pace for a record monthly gain. Today is no exception, up about 10.7% in pre-market trading. The question here is, is this a sign of broader retail participation in a market that could really use it, uh, getting some of that uh, bid on of its side, really creating that bull case for stocks broadly. Let's take a look at Marathon Digital rising once again in line with Bitcoin. This is significant because as we saw Bitcoin drop below that 20,000 level, a lot of that pain was magnified in some of uh, the Bitcoin miners in particular. Marathon Digital was no exception. Now making a little bit of a comeback here, up about 5% in pre-market trading. And my last uh, mover this morning, battery startup Frere signing a $3 billion supply deal for lithium ion batteries with Nadec, the largest manufacturer of high efficiency electric motors. That, of course, giving the shares a little bit of a boost this morning as well to the tune of 16%, Anna. Yeah, new energy stories everywhere. Coming up on the program, then, Chrissy, uh, Shemin Soa Power joins us, head of inflation trading at Bank of Ireland Global Markets. What does she make of the data out of Europe today? What does she think about the moves in bond markets? Are we heading towards um, a, 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 a bear market there? And it's Tuesday, so don't miss Bloomberg Crypto today at 1 p.m. New York time at 6 p.m. in London. Our weekly show covers the people, the transactions and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Uh, more with Matt and uh, Chrissy on that program later. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kriti Gupta, Anna Edwards with us out of London. Now, we talk a lot about the big drop in equities in the first half, but if you look at the drop in bonds, it's the most we've seen in history um, for a six month period. And we saw a little bit of recovery, much like equities in the bond market as well. I'm showing uh, for those listening on radio, our television viewers, the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Bond Index. It is now coming back down and approaching once again a bear market. Simon White joins us, Bloomberg macro strategist. Simon, how bad is it for global bonds and what does this mean for issuance that we're looking forward to in September? Oh, hi, Matt. Um, so we had Powell on Friday. He, as expected, he renewed the Fed's uh, hawkish vows. Um, kind of interestingly enough, you know, the, the longer term government bond yields didn't really do a, a lot. Um, and that's kind of been the, the way things have been going, like short term yields rose because he was hawkish. But if you look at things like the real yield curve and the yield curve, it's not really been transmitted along to longer term yields. Um, and that's really because the expectations are such that, you know, the Fed is going to have to start cutting probably much sooner um, than people expect. I don't think that's the case, but that's kind of what the market is pricing right now. But when it comes to the global aggregate index, you mentioned, you know, that's corporate bonds as well. And I think that's still where um, maybe the penny hasn't quite dropped yet, because not only do they uh, are impacted by uh, the yields uh, as they are today and how hawkish the Fed is. They're also impacted by the lagged effects of um, leverage taken on. And through the pandemic, we saw a huge amount of leverage okay. um, taken on board, and that has yet to feed through into the corporate debt. So do you think the bond markets then still have a misplaced faith in a Fed pivot? Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's very kind of optimistic. Um, I think if uh, the Fed is going to pivot, it's probably not going to happen exactly as the market thinks, certainly when it, it, ha it thinks it's going to happen. Um, so I think it is misplaced still, yeah. OK, Simon, thanks so much for joining us. Good to get your perspective. Simon White of Bloomberg Markets Live. And for more market analysis, check out the Markets Live blog. You'll find postings by Simon and the rest of the team. MLIV Go, that is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here is the first word. Ukraine has launched an offensive along the southern front of its war with Russia. The Ukrainian military says its artillery hit Russian positions around the Kherson region. Kherson is a river port that was one of the first cities to fall to Russian troops. Goldman Sachs warns that the downturn in the U.S. housing market has further to go. In a research note, Goldman says it expects home price growth to average 0% next year due to higher mortgage rates and reduced affordability. But the bank says large price declines are unlikely. 
Coming up, we're going to speak with the number one inflation forecaster as ranked by Bloomberg. Shemin Sower Power joins us. She is head of inflation trading at Bank of Ireland Global Markets. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The markets get the message. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says the recent stock sell-off shows investors understand the Fed is serious about fighting inflation. Meanwhile, global bonds have been sliding toward the first bear market in a generation. The EU is set to intervene in the energy market. The bloc plans to limit price hikes as the continent braces for shortages this winter. And the US will sell $1.1 billion of missiles and radar equipment to Taiwan, the biggest sale in almost two years. It's certain to fan tensions with China. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta over in New York. Kaylee Lines is off today. And Matt, the markets, yes, they heard. They've got the message. We heard from Neil Kashkari. Uh, we saw a sell-off as a result of yep. Jackson Hole. Now a bit of a stabilization. And now what? Yeah, I mean, the real sell-off, obviously, was on Friday. We were down on the S&P 500, 3.4%. Yesterday was down as well, but only about six or seven tenths of 1%. Kashkari was on the Odd Lots podcast with Joe Weisenthal and Tracy Alloway. Uh, definitely urge um, listeners and viewers to check it out. He wasn't happy about the stock market route. What he said was he, he was happy that investors are finally getting the message, which turned into a stock market route on Friday. We're looking at a little bit of a bounce back today. We could, uh, at least as far as futures are telling us right now, make up what we lost on Monday. And we also see investors buying bonds. This kind of messes up the narrative that I was uh, looking at this morning. Global bonds are down almost 20%. So we're almost in a global bond bear market, but we're popping back up a little bit today. And that pushes the yield on the 10-year, for example, down to 3 spot zero six. Five, two. Bloomberg dollar index coming off. Um, it was approaching a record high again yesterday uh, at almost uh, 1300 this time. Right now it's at 1289, so down about 10 points from that. And Bitcoin is bouncing up about 1.2%. It had gone down to 18,000 over the weekend, a little bit below for a moment. Um, and now it's coming back up under 20,000 at 20,417 because it's highly correlated uh, with some of the risk assets that I believe Critty is going to show you right now. Critty? Yeah, well, I'm going to actually look at some of those pre-market movers. Bed Bath & Beyond is where I want to start with because, once again, that retail trading base, it is showing up strong. Uh, this morning, you are seeing a rally about 13% in the pre-market when it comes to Bed Bath & Beyond. For me, I have to ask, does that actually translate into a bigger, broader bid for the macro themes, for the stock market, or even for cryptocurrencies if we're talking about risk sentiment? Which, speaking of, brings me to my next mover, Marathon Digital, also seeing a little bit of a rally this morning, up just shy of about 5% this morning. It has taken a little bit of a beating in the last couple of weeks, so it's really crucial to see if it can actually keep that momentum and really sustain it and actually make it a, a little bit of a turnaround story in line with the broader market. And my third mover here, up about 14%, is battery startup Freyer signing a $3 billion supply deal for lithium ion batteries with Nadek, the largest manufacturer of high efficiency electric motors. That deal, Anna, giving it uh, quite a bit of a boost this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Chrissy, here in Europe, we see European equity markets moving a little bit higher, up by 7 cents of 1%, recovering some of the losses of yesterday. London back in the frame, more volume in the markets then, but it is still the end of August, of course. So London was out yesterday, back today. One of the reassuring factors today, perhaps, is a continuation of the move lower in gas prices that we saw yesterday. And no, we don't want to get too carried away. We still have very elevated prices compared to a couple of years ago. These prices uh, in, in pounds per, per, uh, per BTU or in euros per megawatt, hour they are still very elevated compared to years to, to a couple of years ago but we are seeing a catch-up trade here in london 28 percent lower on the gas price and across europe a continuation of yesterday's heavy selling of gas and we're down 5.7 percent a lot of talk about what europe's going to do to maybe cap prices we'll see where those conversations go early in september and here's brent crude just to keep an eye on what's going on on this part of the commodities market 102 is now the handle i'm sure it was 104 not long ago just half an hour ago in <laughs> fact so actually we've seen quite a retrenchment matt then in that uh, oil priced in just the last half hour down by two and a half percent yeah absolutely um you're seeing that with wti as well at 95.47 a barrel joining us now is shemin sower power head of inflation trading at bank of ireland global markets and 
uh, much like we're seeing in um, the energy market today. Shannon, we've seen a little bit of uh, uh, um, a cooling off of the inflation in Europe today. I think Spain is now at only 10.3% rather than 10.7%. What do you think about, let's start with European infl inflation first. Um, what do you think about the trajectory there? Because I've heard some of the drops are just from, for example, reducing VAT on gas. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, we are actually still seeing um, pressures uh, accumulate and um, also looking at how tight uh, energy markets are. And uh, obviously there is a lot of reaction yesterday and today uh, to von der Leyen's uh, speech on uh, emergency inter intervention by the European Commission uh, on the power market. So we still need to get the details on what they intend to do. Uh, the duration, who will cover the costs of it. Uh, but we've already seen um, yeah, some pullback on the um, European uh, na natural gas prices. And um, also uh, inflation break evens um, have been correcting lower and are still continuing. So um, obviously the energy situation in Europe was like watching a car crash in slow motion. So um, positioning was already heavy as... Um, we know that even though the latest um, storage levels were higher than expected, um, energy okay. uh, demand will accelerate into winter with the heating demand. Okay, and so what does that mean for the ECB, Shemin? Because we've seen some really interesting stories written by, 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 by Bloomberg colleagues and elsewhere about you know, whether we'll see 75 basis points from the ECB, even yes. as these threats mount for the Eurozone economy. And yet Philip Lane pushing back maybe against that, and, and maybe we'll see a real divided ECB this time. Um, yeah, it was very interesting when we saw the sources story on Friday and over the weekend, we actually heard from a number of ECB speakers, including uh, Holtzman, uh, not uh, Kazakhs, and um, Villeroy, and we had a quite bold speech by Schnabel as well. And um, basically, um, many speakers mentioned that 75 base points should be discussed. And uh, we agree, especially looking at the um, um, inflation outlook and also looking at the latest ECB minutes as well, we can see that um, ECB is actually quite concerned about their uh, about the underestimation uh, bias that they had in their projections versus realized inflation. And they're still seeing a very strong momentum uh, in almost all uh, components. And uh, they're also worried that actually with inflation remaining high uh, Shem, for longer, that inflation expectations will adapt to these higher levels. Shemin, I think it's uh, it, interesting Anna mentions Philip Lane because it made me think this morning that European markets may um, be taking the narrative that U.S. markets had pre-Jackson Hole, right? That, that the ECB wants to jack up rates as quickly as possible at first so that they can turn around and cut them in 2023 when a recession, um, I guess it's more inevitable. Something can be more inevitable. More likely is probably a better way to say that. Shemin, do you think that's how markets see it? Um, to be honest, I don't think uh, ECB, that's ECB's uh, way of looking at things because uh, what we heard from a number of speakers was that they actually believe that they might need to push uh, things uh, beyond neutral as well. So Mark was already hearing from ECB speakers that where they see the neutral rate, uh, rate was uh, in 1% to 2% level and we are already pricing in um, rate hikes above uh, these levels. Um, so I completely agree. Market thinks that they need to front load uh, rate hikes, and that's the commentary that we are hearing. But then, uh, how quickly they need to turn and cut? Um, a, data doesn't really justify that. And B, again, if they are uh, fighting uh, possible second round effects, and uh, we know that they're also quite worried as the uh, large labor union negotiations will start, and we know that uh, IG Metall, for example, in Germany is asking for 8% increase. Right. Um, so if they want to push against inflation expectations getting entrenched and adapting to these current 8%, um, 9% levels, I don't think what they have in mind is reversing the rate hikes soon. Let's talk about the currency picture here. It's been my theme when, as I've been watching the markets this morning. But I'm curious how much of the currency story and potential more weakness in, in, in the euro affects the ECB's thinking on how to tackle inflation. Your thoughts? Absolutely agree. I mean, it doesn't really help them that, um, I mean, euro dollar uh, broke uh, parity um, earlier and it doesn't um, help. Uh, 
Isabel Schnabel, in her latest speech, mentioned also that um, global commodity uh, markets are trading in US dollars and uh, the moves in euro dollar are also uh, pushing the energy prices in euro terms higher, but also obviously imported prices, uh, the weaker the euro gets, uh, increase uh, as well. So in uh, a period where um, they are missing their inflation targets for a few years in a row now, and again mm. for next year, uh, we are again expecting them to... Uh, have inflation levels way above target, and uh, when they are trying to break this um, adapt uh, adapting of inflation expectations into the, uh, to these higher levels, uh, the last thing uh, they need is first uh, worth, um, further euro depreciation, adding to inflationary pressures. Okay. And again, as the market is worried about the possible recession, uh, that's not going to help um, appreciation of euro, even though uh, we are revising higher our um, interest rate uh, projections for the ECB. Shemin? Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Shemin Soa Power of Bank of Ireland Global Markets giving us her thoughts on where we go on the European interest rate story and the European economy. We'll stick with the European economy because coming up next, the French industry minister, Roland Lescure. What kind of headwinds is French industry preparing for over the winter? Will we see blackouts? That's one of the questions we need to ask. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking at a live shot at the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with Pandora CEO Alexander Lachik. That's coming at 10.30 a.m. New York, 3.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. We only have one way to go, to cut our energy consumption. I suggest that we organize this reduction together. If we do not do this, if everyone does not do their part, some sudden gas cuts could take place overnight, with serious economic and social consequences. That was the French Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne calling on businesses in France to cut energy consumption this winter or risk facing sudden blackouts. She was speaking at the French business lobby's MEDEF annual conference. Uh, from there, we are now joined by the French industry minister, Roland Lescure. Uh, minister Lescure, very uh, warm welcome to Bloomberg TV. Thank you very much for joining us. We have heard from one large French business today, that is Angie, the utility. They have said that Gazprom is going to send a reduced flow of gas to Angie uh, in coming weeks. How worrying is that kind of development? Well, good morning and thanks for the invitation. Uh, at least it's proving the Prime Minister's point. When she was here yesterday, she kind of called for you know, general responsibility vis-à-vis -vis the potential cuts that we're going to have on, on, on gas deliveries. And 24 hours later or even less, Angie is telling us that Gazprom is again lowering gas deliveries in Europe and in France. So we have to face the music. In a way, the message we're sending business owners is we're getting ready for the worst in order to avoid the worst. So if we mm. lower our consumption of non-necessary energy in advance, we won't have to face harsher cuts when winter comes. Okay. And what response have you had from business to the Prime Minister's speech, uh, Minister? So we heard from Elizabeth Bourne, the Prime Minister. She was calling on business to cut energy use or face rationing. How has business responded? Well, they understand, you know, the global situation. They're open to the world. They're exporters. They're importers. And a lot of them have had a major rise in their energy bills. And I would say about half of them have not been able to transform those rise in energy bills in prices. And those are suffering very heavily. And in a way, those have started already saving any energy that you know, they don't use. From numbers I've got in the French industry, about 10% of gas consumption has already been avoided. So we probably want to go further, especially for the companies that so far have been able to translate those rises in energy, in energy bills, sorry, in production prices, in selling prices, and those probably haven't felt the pain that much. So they understand they have to do it. They don't like when a prime minister or an industry minister tells them what to do. But I think they understand that the, the, the joint responsibility is to make any effort we can make in order to avoid 
harsher constraints. You're just making suggestions. Tell me, you're just making suggestions. What, what about um, the nuclear advantage that you have? I mean, assuming temperatures drop a little as we head into the winter, doesn't France's nuclear industry um, give the rest of your uh, economy a huge advantage over Europe? It is. It is already doing so. But you have to understand that the nuclear production capacities are not turning 100 percent now because there's some some um, uh, how would you say you know when you have to entertain the, the new nuclear reactor repair them fix them make sure that they work better in the future so at the moment about 50 percent of the production capacity in maintenance thank you is uh, about 50 percent of, of the current capacity is in order so we need to make sure that those maintenance operations are speeded up so that sometimes next year we can again increase those production capacities. In the meantime, France and the rest of Europe has to make an effort. And in that respect, I'd like to salute what the, you know, the head of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said yesterday. That I think they've understood something that France was asking and has been asking for a few months. The way the energy market works in Europe needs to change so that electricity and gas don't go hand in hand as much as they used to and that we can probably go towards collective purchasing of gas so that we have a better bargaining power. There's a few pieces, a few tracks that uh, the Commission is looking at that we're going to discuss with them in the next couple of weeks so that Europe faces that crisis the same way Europe has faced the COVID crisis together, united, because united Europe is always stronger. Mr. I'm curious about simply supply chain issues here in the States. It's something that could last, we're looking at years here. For France, how do you particularly try to look at perhaps regaining some of that uh, industrial sovereignty at a time when those supply chain crunches are expected to last for quite a while? Well, it's, a, it's an absolute necessity. It's an economic necessity. If you want to create jobs, we need to have industries here. It's a social necessity. It's an environmental you know, necessity, because as you know, when you import goods that are produced from the other side of the world, then you're producing CO2 emissions, again, that are detrimental to the environment. But it's also a political necessity. In the States, in England, in France, people who are away from big cities, they've been suffering from globalization. Even though globalization has raised in the tide, we've taken a billion people out of poverty, we've innovated like there's no tomorrow for the last 20 to 30 years. Some parts of the territories, and in France especially, have felt that they didn't enjoy that part of the story, and therefore they've turned mm. to extremist, extreme right, populist solutions that we want to fight. So we need to do it. The way we're going to do it is by aligning public and private investments, making sure that we finance the industries of tomorrow. You know, we want mm. to get out of the fossil fuel car towards electric cars in the next 15 years, where to do so, we need to make sure that we build batteries here, that we assemble electric vehicles here, and we're going to do that. OK, and Minister, back to the challenges that the French economy faces right now. What chance do you put on a recession in France? Can you give me a, a percentage chance? I mean, you're very well connected, obviously, to industry and to, to, to what makes the, what drives the French economy. Well, you know, I used to be an economist and I used to risk forecasting the economy and I've made enough mistakes as an economist not to reproduce them as a minister. So I won't give you a probability. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that a potential recession is um, risky if we have the combination of two things, a shock, and we're having a shock, and a change in animal spirits. So far, business expectations are remaining pretty good because we have a business-friendly government, because we've made measures that have, raised, that have lowered taxes, that have made French industry more competitive. So we're going to keep on grinding at what we can do, which is keep on making the French industry more competitive, making sure that businesses that are resembled here trust us in order to accompany them on the ways of growth and a more sustainable growth. And we're going to live with the shocks. Again, prepare for the worst so that we avoid it. That's the main goal we have for the next few weeks. OK, Minister, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. The French Indust Industry Minister, Roland Lescure, joining us there from the MEDEF conference in Paris. Now, coming up later today on Balance of Power, an exclusive interview with the Bank of Israel governor. That conversation at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kriti Gupta here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. And Tom Keen now joins us, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, co-anchor and creator of the original Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom, what's your single best chart to kick off your program today? Well, it's August. In honor of Kriti Gupta, we've got an ugly chart. We like to do, you know, charts that where Kriti just goes, you got to be kidding me. This thing is hideous. <laughs> Let's go to the American housing market. And what you need to see is a long-term trend back 20 years is remarkably flat, but boy, is it cyclical with a big up into 2007, down we go, an absolutely crater into 2008, and then a long trot back to the huge explosion now. And going back, this is May statistics, so it's a little dated, but Matt, the big feature here is the balloon out now is bigger than the balloon out in 05 and 07. The white circle, folks, is top of the market mm. where Matt Miller mm. bought the 8,000 square feet he has north of New York <laughs> City. <clears throat> okay, he's crying into his tea this morning, that's all. So, ugly chart, but no doubt a fantastic lineup of guests. Who have you got? Uh, we're going to really dive into it. This is the quietest market day and I've seen in ages, and that is to be celebrated where we can really talk about the view forward. Hey, Kathy Rosie. Jones will join us from Charles Schwab. Really looking forward uh, to that. And I am thrilled to bring you today David Rosenberg. He is the absolute best partitioner of price change I know uh, iconic at Merrill Lynch and now with Rosenberg research up in Toronto David Rosenberg will explain the rapid disinflation to come Tom Keene of Bloomberg Surveillance, we thank you as always, uh, even with your ugly charts. Let's take a look at what we're watching. I'm watching specifically some uh, eco data we're about to get in a couple of hours. U.S. consumer confidence expected to come in just a little bit stronger than the prior reading. And of course, ahead of payrolls Friday, we also get the jolt job openings, Matt. A lot to watch when it comes to whether or not we're going to get some loosening in the labor market. Yeah, uh, that's key to watch. Um, I will also be watching uh, well, first of all, I'm going to watch David Rosenberg on surveillance because it's always great to hear what he has to say. But this chart um, is also ugly. 20% almost since the peak. That's the drop that we've seen in the global bond market. It was the worst first half of all time. Paul Sweeney loves to talk about this, so tune in to our radio program at 10 a.m. to hear mm. a lot of bond talk. Anna? Yes, you'll be doing a lot of Bitcoin talk later, a lot of crypto talk, right? There's the crypto show. One, I'll also be watching one. that just so we yeah. keep plugging our own shows. That's important. I'll also be watching German inflation data, uh, Matt, because we've had the regional numbers. Some of those didn't look quite as ugly as expected, and that has actually added a bit of a bid to bonds in the European session. So we'll uh, look for that later. That is it for Early Edition. More surveillance is ahead. Tom, John and Lisa will be here. This is Bloomberg.